Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. And uh, today I want to go to Tashkent, Uzbekistan, uh, and, and to Vilnius, Lithuania. And then I have a pal who I want to talk to here in Toronto. So we're going to have a, a fun event, get, getting acquainted and talking about uh, Russian expatriates and how to, I don't know how to help them. I uh, can't help them, but I, I'm all in favor of them. And some of them are in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, it, uh, let me let me tell you who's in Tashkent. My friend Konstantin Samoyla, uh who's a Russian, who's moved to Tashkent uh, because he just didn't like the idea of going to kill Ukrainians. And he has collected over a thousand other uh, Russians who have also left the country, uh, mostly for the same reason. And uh, they hang out together. He created a breakfast club, which was going to be a support group for Russian expatriates. And um, and it, it's, it's that and more now, because I gather they have political interests as well as um, their concerns about trying to survive in a new environment. And in Vilnius, Lithuania, is my friend Andrei Kamenshikov. I, uh, my name is Andrei Kamenshikov, and I uh, coordinate the Eastern European part of GPAC, which stands for the Global Partnership for Prevention of Armed Conflict. It's a global civil society peace building network and I coordinate the Eastern European branch of it. And it is, as I understand it, kind of an umbrella organization of peace organizations, right? Is that a fair characterization? I guess so, yeah. Even though some of the organizations are, you know, they don't position themselves like peace organizations, but one or another way they work in areas that are related to peace building. Mm -hmm. Good. Excellent. And here in Toronto, is my friend Jill Carr Harris. Uh, Jill is a, a big time Gandhian. <laughs> I guess that's the quickest way to characterize her. And she's been living in India. She's a Canadian. Um, and she's been living in India for, I think, 37 years. And uh, she she's married to uh, Raja Gopal, who is one of the great Gandhian leaders today, the ones, there are apparently not so many left in India, which is going pretty right wing and politically in a direction that I don't always like. But there are some people who actually do constructive uh, work, and uh, she and her partner are engaged with uh, helping, uh, especially young men, to uh, get skills so that they village men can get skills that they can use um, to um, to make a living. Is that a fair characterization? I, uh, I would say no. young men and women who are from marginalized backgrounds to get above subsistence and to make a living. Yeah. I want to start off, if you will, by having Constantine uh, talk to us about his club, because I think, it, uh, you know, I, I should also say, maybe, that Andre is in Vilnius, not because that's where he lives, but because he travels around trying to contact people and uh, stir up uh, peace. Uh, and uh, I was, you know, there's always a tendency to stir up trouble. That's what I do, but he stirs up peace. And uh, he uh, is on a trip now to talk, I, I believe, with um, people like the Breakfast Club folks, people who've left Russia um, because they didn't approve of the war, and to see whether anything can be done to help bring them together so that they collectively can do something very constructive. So your work is very similar to the Breakfast Clubbing, that Constantine does, but uh, Andre, also you're doing work that is very similar to what Jill has done for the last 37 years. So that's our beginning. I want us, I want us to know what goes on in the minds of these people who have left Russia. Tell us about your breakfast club, Constantine. 
Thank you, Meta. I'd like to start uh, with telling that uh, Andre Kamenchiko is actually a member of our Breakfast Club. He's visited, you know, he visited in the, in mm -hmm. the spring, in March, I believe. April. Attended a few meetings, attended some of the lecture, met quite a few people, then uh, followed up. We followed up with um, a strategic session discussion. And uh, so uh, there's two of us today. <laughs> And this is the story behind the Breakfast Club. Um, I left Russia in September 20 of uh, last year, 22. And it was, um, well, basically I had 36 hours to leave. I made a decision after mobilization was announced. And I told that story numerous times on my YouTube channel. And um, 36 hours to leave. Uh, it's really difficult when you have to wrap your life up and cut off your bridges, you know, and life in one place and you step in, into darkness, into unknown. So that's what I did. I flew to Tashkent, Uzbekistan, uh, through Tajikistan. So basically I landed in Tajikistan, um, crossed the border on foot to Uzbekistan and made it to Tashkent. And then I saw as personally devastating experience incredibly devastating i it's basically you you feel like your life is over and you don't know what to do next because mm -hmm. you leave so abruptly without a plan without like all your plans for life they just can not cancel at once and um uh for a couple of days i was just wandering on the streets of tashkent listening to music trying not to think of anything okay it's too painful and didn't work that well and then um at one point i decided to get together with others that they were thousands of people just like me wandering around the streets of Tashkent and uh you know that's I started inviting people for coffee for breakfast and um, I used different means of you know giving shout outs different telegram channels I created my own telegram channel and uh, one by one people started showing up and to lure people more people i invited uh, everyone to uh, breakfast is on me you show up i'll buy you breakfast but the main purpose was to help myself and help the others um it's incredibly difficult to be by yourself alone in a situation like that and by sitting with a person right next to you at the one table in the same situation speaking to a person is incredibly therapeutic and that's what happened. We started getting together. And I remember the first meeting when quite a few people showed up, seven grown men in their 40s, you know, some businessmen, engineer, doctor, um, all established, you know, not like youngsters. And uh, all of a sudden we got together and then everyone started talking at once. It's like attending Alcoholic Anonymous meeting in a way, you know, only we don't drink. <laughs> and uh yeah and then everyone started just unloading there and everyone started feeling better and that's basically from there and on we developed there was one person that was me and now was, uh, we have thousand plus people about 850 in our telegram group and um over 200 that don't want to join telegram but the here in tashkent the members of tashkent breakfast club um i started making well uh, organizing lectures every sunday around november because i was feeling that everyone was not doing well psychologically and the, well, the first shock was over and then the culture shock set in so i started inviting psychologists to help people somehow mm -hmm. and then we started doing sunday big meetings when uh, we pick an expert and an expert says something about a topic of expertise in um around new year about a year ago, I decided that mission needs to be broader. And I started looking for Ukrainians here in Tashkent and inviting them to to our table, basically. So we sit together with Ukrainians and break bread with them and uh, just try to make amends. And the rest is history. Um, a few weeks ago, we celebrated one year anniversary of our reloc relocation of our exodus from Russia and um, one year of Breakfast Club. So uh, made a film. We had some speakers, some guests. The biggest speaker was the ambassador of Estonia to the Central Asia, 
Yeah, he came from Kazakhstan to take participation in the Breakfast Club. It was, uh, there were Ukrainians, there were Russians, Uzbek, Israelis. Um, it was a it was a great meeting gathering. And that's a um, short history of our group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I want to know about your uh, uh, how they are doing, how these people are doing now. How many of the people? I presume that went that your contact is made with them when they arrive, or while they're in Tashkent, but that a lot of them move on to other countries uh, or other locations. Is that the case? Meta, um, my statistics is this. Many people treated Uzbekistan as a transit, not the destination. Um, I would say that about 40% came and went, uh, and about 40 or 50% stayed, because Uzbekistan is a very Russian-friendly location. It's probably one of the most friendliest in the world for Russians, uh, especially if you don't have to work, make your living in Uzbekistan. If you work remotely, it's Russian-speaking country. It's very loyal and very, um, very, um, very nice attitude to Russians. It's it's expensive. <laughs> it's probably as expensive as Moscow, um, but generally nice, nice climate. You know the mountains nearby, so it's a very convenient and uh, safe location for the Russians. So I'd say perhaps half, you know, something like that stayed. Um, and now, half... as I understand it, they they can get in without a visa, right? Which no is... visa. That's right. They can uh -huh. stay indefinitely. We can sure. stay indefinitely. No visa. Yeah, and and there are lots of other problems with most other countries, right? There are only a few countries that will let people walk right in from from Russia, right? Okay. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the only one. In other countries, you can you don't have to vi have visas. For example, Kazakhstan, but you have to do visa run to leave country once every ninety days and come back. Mm -hmm. It's called a visa run. So visa uh, run, <laughs> a visa, yeah, visa run. run. Is it? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> the term that we commonly use. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Actually, Andre can probably brief us a little bit on which countries uh, have the same hospital hospitable. Um, attitude toward Russians. Uh, I, I know you've been going around to a lot of the post-Soviet countries. Um, and uh, where are they as friendly to Russians? And, and how do they differ, different countries, in the attitude of the general population toward Russians and, and, um, and the uh, ease of letting people come in? Um. Every country has its specifics. Um, and one thing that people need to understand that their uh, citizens of Russia have two types of passports. One is considered an internal passport. It's a document that's used internally. And that's a document that every, uh, every person has. Every, uh, you know, if you... Is it something you're required to carry around with you all the time? Or if well, you're... If you're going to take a trip, say from one well, country to another, he, you have to have he, it. Done. He, here's 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 what I'm explaining. There are two documents. Yeah. One is this internal passport that everybody has. Another is a uh, external passport that is like uh, you know the typical passport of any nation you know that is used by citizens of that nation to travel internationally. Mm -hmm. And that is a document that is it's been it is given for five or ten years. You need to apply for it. It's a bureaucratic procedure. So probably I would say that less than half of the population uh, of Russia, maybe only a third or so, actually have a functioning external passport. And without that document, there are only a few countries that people can enter. Uh, uh, with the internal passport, I don't think Uzbekistan also allows Russians to, I don't know, Konstantin might know better. But I don't think Uzbekistan allows Russians without this external passport to uh, enter its, its borders. I think it's uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Armenia, and Belarus. 
four countries that do not require that you have this external pass. Not Georgia? The, no, not Georgia. What that means is that uh, if you just take randomly, you know, two-thirds of a population do not uh, have a, a document that they can use to enter any place except these uh, four countries. Now, then there are the people that do have the Russian external passport, and they have a wider uh, set of options. They can, uh, and then the question is, are the uh, do countries require visa special permission or not? And in that case, you know, now you have countries like Uzbekistan, Georgia, Azerbaijan, uh, Moldova, uh, where uh, people can go. Also, I think Israel uh, doesn't require visas. Um, China, Mongolia, and so forth. So it's it's a wider uh, range of options. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the issue of the attitude of the government of a country and the attitude of the population. Of it. For example, in Georgia, you have a uh, government that is actually has a fairly decent relationship with the Russian leadership and uh, is the country is open for Russians to enter without a visa. But the uh, attitude of the population in Georgia to Russians is uh, more difficult because, of course, Georgia, you know, it lost part of its territory because of uh, the mm -hmm. armed conflicts where Russia was a part and, not on the side of Georgia. So as a result, you know, there is an issue with uh, relationships between like in Georgia, where you have a substantive Russian, Russian community, there's very little effective interaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the population in Georgia, you know, they, some people benefit because Russia come, Russians come with money, you know, as tourists or so forth. They, they, uh, rent apartments and so forth others don't like that because as a result the uh, the costs of like renting apartment in Belize have gone way up so so are, are, they, are you implying that the attitude of people on the street toward incoming russians is less cordial in georgia than it might be let's say in tashkent uh, yes i think so i think Absolutely. so overall Mm -hmm. I've seen, I've seen uh, when I was in Georgia, I've seen like on one of the subway stations uh, posters, you know, just on the escalator next to escalator, someone just put on posters like that actually said Russians live in fear, you know, and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and Russians not, go home. And I, I also have, uh, we have a center in, in, in Bilisi and I have some Georgian background. So I've been there quite often and yeah, it's very, uh, is very noticeable. Very yeah. noticeable. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, uh, oh. can I ask, uh, uh, what about India, Jill? How uh, is it, it, how easy would it be for Russians to try to go and settle in India? So India has a very strict policy of giving people any kind of uh, uh, permits. So they could probably come on tourist visas, but to get a OCI card or a PIO card or anything which grants you longer term permanency is very difficult. Uh, almost, uh, you know, not, not possible. So I don't think we have any long term uh, Russian communities. As what, far as what I about the attitude of, of average, whatever? Uh, Indians toward average Russians. So there's been a fairly cordial relationship between the Indian government and uh, the Russian government. But then uh, India is balancing uh, its interests with the US and with the security of Asia, which demands, um, you know, US uh, against the Chinese threat. So I think it's um, it's sort of a mixed a um, more strategic, pragmatic relationship than it is, uh, you know, one of, you know, camaraderie. Or uh, uh, compare, if you will, <clears throat> social interactions that you've had about uh, Russia in Canada, Georgia, and India. 
what what's can you can you say that there are different characteristic points of view or feelings about Russia? So I have part of my family living in Moscow. So my brother married a Russian woman, um, and uh, he is on, I think, some sort of visa which doesn't give him full citizenship rights. Um, he spends a lot of time in Georgia. So he um, has, you know, given us a window on seeing Russians in a very positive light. However, my Georgian cousins uh, who have seen, who believe that Russia has occupied uh, 30%, 25, 30% of the country, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, uh, are not favorable. So I've had the benefit of seeing both sides of this equation. And I also have a Ukrainian daughter-in-law, so um, who is of Russian heritage. So her parents have been, um, you know, uh, uh, ousted out of Odessa. They live in Denmark with their other daughter. Um, and uh, so I've I've had quite a bit of <laughs> yeah. different sides of the prism, mm -hmm. uh, but feel, um, yeah, feel a closeness to a lot of Russian people, but... Um, uh, have have uh, seen also the difficulties. You know, we tried to set up in in uh, the South Caucasus a for many many years a peace zone where Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia would be more autonomous, mm -hmm. independent of Moscow, uh, because you know as a result of the Soviet Union, all roads lead to Moscow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so any veering off to Europe uh, has been, but we were trying as, as a Gandhian stance to try to bring the three countries together. That has been extremely difficult, not only because of the internal difficulties uh, between Azerbaijan, Armenia and Turkey's role and so on, Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm happy to see that Georgia has now played a more important role in the peacekeeping of Azerbaijan and Armenia recently, very recently. Uh, so my experience is the very great difficulties of mm -hmm. trying to get any autonomous uh, autonomous ness um from you know from Russia uh uh in building those societies and those economies so that's really the vantage point that i the location i have in this discussion the position that i know several friends in living in in canada uh who are russian and uh who are very opposed to the war and uh they are in touch with their own families of course but always it it was so acrimonious that uh, phone calls have now, they continue making phone calls, but they pretend there's no war going on. They never mention it uh, as a way of, you know, keeping any kind of relationship going. It, it would, would you say that anything that severe has occurred in your own family among all these people who no doubt have quite different points of view? Yeah, absolutely. The acrimony is under the surface. And so one has to be very diplomatic in maintaining the family relationship, surely. Uh, Andre, I, I know that part of your mission as a, as a peace worker is to try to see what can be done to, to exploit the uh, contacts that Russian expatriates have with their families and friends and former colleagues. Uh, to to try to change or influence public opinion in, or at least their families, some people's opinion in Russia. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, and I'd like to see how you and Constantine view the possibilities. Um, I'm not sure you are very optimistic. I I want to know whether Constantine is more so. But since Andre, you start off and see, and then let's see what Constantine thinks about your prospects for success? Well, um, yeah, I've been spending lots of time this year trying to see if the, uh, the uh, this new wave of uh, immigrants from Russia 
who hundreds of thousands, if not millions, we don't know the figures, if these people who left because of the war might also become effective communicators in a trying to bring uh, more or less objective information about what is happening to the attention of their circle of friends and relatives and acquaintances in Russia. Uh, it is a challenging task. Uh, so far, uh, I was able to get some groups of people to speak about the general um, uh, and, and to start learning, you know, generally about communication and how to improve their communication capacities. Uh, it is hard for me to judge today whether that had a effect, or I know it had some effect, but how much that had an effect on their capability to speak to their friends and relatives in Russia about sensitive issues. Uh, I'm still working on that. We're still trying to expand, and we're basically just trying to find. You know, it's, it's uh, we're we're walking. You know, we're we're feeling our way. You know, in a, in a cave. You know, where there's no light. You know, there's no really examples that we can follow very well. So we're mm -hmm. just trying to find ways how that can be more effective. Um, and uh, but I think that it's still something worth exploring because again, with hundreds of thousands of people have left, they have access to millions and millions of people in Russia, and what's more important, they have access to many of the people that they have access to in Russia are not are people that you can say belong to the silent majority of the Russian population. These are people who will not, on their own make an effort to search for independent information on the internet, for example, about what is going on today. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the issue, because if someone wants to find information, he can. And there are millions and millions of people in Russia who understand more or less what has happened. Obviously, opposed the current policies of their government, even though under the harsh political regime, they there's not much that they can do, very little that they can do. But nonetheless, that's very important. But uh, there's the silent majority who do not necessarily like what has happened. You know, they don't necessarily support the war as such. Uh, it's uh, not true that the war is supported by the vast majority of the Russian population. Most people don't like the war, but they have been... Uh, silence, and they have been brainwashed to the level where they kind of accept the policies. They see, they think that this is, you know, this is not something good, but something that's inevitable, and we don't have any influence on it in any case. So, you know, let's let's treat it like an earthquake, something that's bad that we can't do it. So that's okay. the kind of people that are very important to reach. Okay, I'd like to hear whether Constantine has a different uh, experience, or um, yeah, just how how does his comment fit with your own experience with the Breakfast Clubbers? Meta, uh, this is actually a pretty short and and straight to the point. Uh, tons of people, well, old people who are here in Breakfast Club, they have family or friends remaining in Russia constantly communicating some who are left there do not support the war some do um and some, people some, sorry some of the people left in russia do not and yeah, some do, yeah. uh, do not but all of the, uh, practically yeah. all of the people in tashkent do not support the war right on non-supports uh, i'm talking about the ones who left in yeah. russia some mm -hmm. parents you know mm -hmm. and so forth and uh and uh, we communicate on daily basis but that's personal communication you know so it's possible to reach them it's possible but uh each one of us reinvents the will so to speak that's pretty much it andre when he was visiting he saw that we even uh, talked to people about that okay and now when they call in fact i'm i've never 
I'm still touchy and cautious. Well, more than cautious. I simply do not call people in Russia anymore because I'm I'm worried that I might get them in trouble, or at least I'm worried that they think they might get in trouble by talking to me, whether or not that's real. Now, that's how real that's would that be? Do, that's true. do people ever get in trouble in Russia for for receiving and being part of a phone call for, uh, from somebody abroad who talks bad about the government? Uh, they will not get in trouble if it's uh, just a simple talk call from abroad about the family business or friends. Once they start discussing plans against the government, plotting and stuff like that, I'm pretty sure that uh, people in Russia are under direct risk. Uh, so somebody's listening to a lot of the phone calls. I think most phone calls I listen to. Really? So it, even even people calling from Tashkent have to think about whether or not they might get their family in trouble. If they don't discuss anything against the government, they do not get in trouble. Even if they criticize, but they don't plot, if you know what I mean. They don't make certain plans, actions. And well, now there's where that's where the problem lies, right? Because what I was hoping was that we could create a a vast worldwide network of expatriate Russians who make lots and lots of phone calls to Russia and stir up uh, resistance, <laughs> um, some kind of opposition. Um, but, you know, <laughs> please, uh, how realistic is, is that as a fantasy of mine? Uh, I, I actually, I mentioned this to Andre before, that his work and, and what I would like to support and even uh, take some initiative in is is getting Russians who've left the country to make a lot of phone calls to their family and friends back at home and try to inform them and change the opinions that are, are prevailing there. Well, obviously, if they would be getting their families in trouble, that doesn't have much prospect of success. Let's say there are many breakfast clubs all over the world of Russian expatriates like yours, and they are very political and they all come up with a similar vision of what they would like Russia to become politically. If they, if they collectively have conversations worldwide among themselves and come up with a vision and yeah. an agenda for Russia, uh, would this have any influence? And if it has any influence, you say it's probably not going to have much influence inside Russia. But would it have any influence outside Russia? Would this I new understand. network of political, let's say, expatriate democratic Russians uh, have any influence among um with let's say the canadian government or you know the the government in any in in tashkent or um actually i've traveled to different countries uh, i've been to thailand i've been to turkey and every place has an skp community Turkey has huge community. Thailand has quite large community. And I established, I tried to establish breakfast club in each one of those countries. Oh, it's have difficult. You? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's difficult, um, but possible. We can organize, we can communicate, but we don't know what to do, basically. There's no, you know, nowhere to go. We don't know. We're like blind kittens. Hmm. Okay. Now, when I mentioned the idea of trying to help uh, create a dialogue among expatriate Russians or ex ex escapee Russians, uh, I was discouraged by Andre, who said, all they'll do is get together and fight. <laughs> so, Andre, uh, tell me, what do you think? No, it's uh, a little more complicated. Of course, people will, if you start discussing politics, there's probably a clear uh, uh, agenda that a majority of people who were forced to leave because of the political situation in Russia 
would agree on. You know, they want Russia to be a normal country, uh, you know, safe, uh, where human rights are respected, where, you know, property rights are respected and so forth. So there, there are lots of basic things that I think people will agree on. The big issue is, you know, will that have any practical influence on what uh, is actually happening in the country? My idea is that if we can uh, encourage people to become more effective communicators with their circles of, uh, with their contacts in Russia, then what we can do is uh, we can't demand, I don't feel that I have the moral dem right to demand from anyone in Russia any specific action that can put a person uh, safety in, in jeopardy. That's not something that I'm willing to do. But I am willing to express my opinions on things and uh, to share my opinions with uh, anyone, any contact I have in Russia. It's their, I, it's their decision then what to do with these opinions, to believe me or not, to take action or not. That's a decision that people should make in the country. What we uh, can do from outside is simply provide people with certain information and especially try to maintain a channel of information. So even those who are not, uh, uh, not critically minded, who are not really you know, thinking much about, you know, is the policies uh, of the government justified or not, and who are not asking these difficult questions of themselves, at least are exposed to some alternative information. Now, my calculation is that as long as this war lasts, and it will last, it seems, for a long time, the uh, demands that the Russian government will be putting on every ordinary Russian citizen will continue to grow. Not very fast, maybe, but, you know, for some, they demand the ultimate sacrifice of a person, you know, uh, giving up his life for, for Putin's ambitions. Uh, for someone, it's uh, related to their well-being, to the well-being of their relatives, to the lives of their close relatives, friends, children, and so forth. And all of that means that this, 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 the burden that the Russian government is putting on the shoulders of every ordinary citizen is growing. And at some point, every person will have to question the uh, validity of the arguments that the government is selling to him when it tries to increase his burden. Mm -hmm. And the personal choice that a person will be making will depend on the information that he has been exposed to. If the only information he has been exposed to is government propaganda, then he'll just probably go on with whatever demands are, are imposed on him. Mm -hmm. But if he, has, uh, uh, if he has been at least exposed to alternative views, that might give him some uh, some thought, some some background, some some uh, you know some uh, uh, some base to try to take a different action. Mm -hmm. It's not in someone's personal interest to go to war, to give up your life, or to risk your well-being, or to lose your family, or things like that, or to allow your children to go to. War. Or allow your husband to go to, or do or doing other things. You know, not necessarily going to fight, but for example, going to uh, you know people are going to these uh, territories, being sent to uh, perform various tasks, do work in these territories that Russia now claims are part of integral part of Russia territories that it, it conquered. Okay, let's Ukraine. let's play with this. Things like that. Uh, and so the the idea. Okay. I just want to finish. The idea is. If we can provide information that might uh, have some effect on the personal choices that yes. people are making, not because we told them to make this choice, but because in the you know as they weigh the different options for themselves, they will have alternative point of view that they will have to consider or that they might want to consider. Well, the world is full of people who would 
prefer democracy and human rights and all the things that we, we value, but they have no idea how to struggle for these things. Meta, Andrew, can I, can I add something? Yeah. You have no idea how many angry people there are here. All of us are extremely angry. We feel betrayed. We feel absolutely enraged. Okay. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a force. It's just, it's not being used. It's not being organized. There's no direction to move, nothing. But there's a force. And uh, as time goes, people become mellower. Okay. Because, you know, mellower. They start mellower yeah. If you, uh, if someone talked to us last November, oh my God. Uh, that would have been a different story. Now everyone's kind of moving on with their lives, okay? Mm -hmm. But still, people are going to be angry for quite a bit, of, quite, mm -hmm. quite some time. And, and uh, nothing's being done. That's why I'm trying to organize the breakfast clubs in different countries, at least to have some network, mm -hmm. okay? And um, I'd say 10 to 15% of people are activists. A lot of them, if you approach and start talking politics, probably a lot would drop out. But there are quite a few people who'd be involved. So I see you, Constantine, setting up a set of affinity groups. You know, they're basically affinity around what? Well, around you started in giving them support in their desperation of being out of the country. Now, possibly it's moved, evolved a little bit where you're uh, looking at, would, wouldn't it be nice if this war stopped so we could, you know, have our families and get back to what we would like to, to have in the future? And probably, I, I'm just guessing, some of these 10 to 15 percent activists are also thinking, what would it look like in a post-Putin uh russia you know what what would that look like you know what are we striving for right now i i put that forward because it's implicit you know people are practical pragmatic you know they're they're not just idealists but there's some sort of they're visioning also at the same time right otherwise what gives you hope <laughs> you know yeah. uh you know you need some sort of hope like where are we going with all this it's not just about you know whining with each other or you know getting into this real cynical you know nothing works existential problem right mm -hmm. uh, so we need some sort of hope so i think the social visioning uh if it gets a little more i'm not saying it should be imposed by anybody but if it can emerge that okay, next year isn't next year, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, we need to renew Putin's mandate in 24 uh, for the next 12 years. It's been uh, renewed already. <laughs> it's been renewed, yeah. But there's we a just formal, don't know about it yet. <laughs> there's a formal process, right? So, you know, that is a hook when you're organizing people in affinity groups, that's a hook you get onto, right? Okay, 24. Uh, we want to give people an idea of what a post-Putin era looks like, <laughs> not just say it's going to happen, it's inevitable, closed story. If you don't make those openings, people can't push forward. The affinity groups get locked into resignation. You know, if Andre's communication about the situation with the war can can also include a sense that the majority of people would like to get beyond this war, you know, find ways to not just, you know, give information, but give information in a way that people can use that information in a way forward. Um we, a uh, hundred percent of us, we discuss all the time what the future of Russia looks like. Post-Putin, not post-Putin. Uh, that's all of us. It's um, what I meant, 10, 15 percent the active. If you say, you got to do this and this, yeah. uh, okay, we're on with you. That's what I meant, 10, 15 percent. But hundred percent right. are definitely... Um, Is there a way that that can get put into some sort of consensus document, something which is giving people 
a a a you know a, a way to articulate this rather than just offhanded comments so that you can build a kind of a consensus across these breakfast clubs because otherwise there's nothing linking people right there has to be some sort i'm not saying a common agenda that's too uh, simple mm -hmm. simplistic but some sort of common document that emerges from a process I, you... I understand i understand yeah. yeah um jill first of all is breakfast club here in tashkent that's well established and i uh i'm the founder and i influence we have administrators we can do it within our tashkent breakfast club we have to be very careful about showing uh any political actions here in tashkent because we're we're being watched by the yeah. uh, intelligence community the local uh and they we've been warned uh fox not just us, but all the Russians have been warned. If you show any kind of political activity, uh, you'd better leave Uzbekistan or we'll make you leave. Okay, so we are bound by certain rules in this country. Okay, even though it's not against Uzbek government or anything, but still, it's it's a fact that we have to account taken account into account. So, but we still can do things like um, what you're saying here in in in, in Tashkent Breakfast Club, but. In order to consolidate other <laughs> breakfast clubs, we need to establish them because I went, I tried, I got some contacts, but I cannot say that, oh, there's one in Thailand, there's one in Turkey, there's one in Georgia. I know some people there, but and I'm trying my best, but <laughs> it's, sometimes it, it feels like I'm running against the wind and it's me against the world alone. Okay, it's just my ideas. Okay, that's that's it. And I'm doing my best, but I can't say that. I can uh, attract people like, like I said, in those countries, and we'll start drafting something. Okay, just here in Tashkent. Um, you know, both of you have been talking, or we've talked a little bit about uh, a vision of what Russia should look like after Putin, and of course that's essential. And 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 yet uh, we've already discussed how difficult it is to have that conversation. But there's another dimension that is how to get there how to get to a post-Putin world or a more democratic world, how to make some changes. And in that, uh, I think Russians are um, in the same situation as people in other, every other country. That is, there are some, there we need methods of getting social change that are themselves nonviolent. And th there are technologies, there are strategies, there are methods, there are approaches that people have studied. For example, I'm a was a, a friend of Gene Sharp's, and Gene Sharp spent many, many years, his life basically, studying the cases around the world in which people have tried to resist against a, a dictator or some other uh, situation that they found oppressive and uh, un untenable and and yet wanted people who wanted to do so without violence or making too much trouble and so there, there are many there there are people who actually make their their uh, professional lives out of trying to develop ways of, of creating social change that are not have no discernible harmful side effects Jill does that, of course, as Gandhians in, in India and everywhere else. Uh, Andre is doing that as well. But there is possible to even give courses on how to do nonviolent resistance and which things work under what circumstances, etc. There's there's quite a, 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 a an extensive literature on that kind of thing. But it's not well known in any country. I, I mean, people here in Canada or the U.S. or Europe who want to do uh, make some changes uh, have very limited ideas about how to go about it with any prospect of success. So there's always a, 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 a gain to be made in giving courses on nonviolence um, or trainings on how to how to do it. Um, so I, I I'm wondering whether that might not be uh, the, the first step, that is, um, give, give some, some, you know, trainings or conversations about um, 
methods of of resisting or making uh, so, social changes uh, that have some prospect of success. And uh, before you get to the point of what are we going to do, what kind of government do do Russians want to have once they get rid of uh, the one they have now? Uh, so is there a room for that kind of of thing. I'm thinking, for example, uh, Jill and Andre and uh, some many other people that I know who who have studied uh, nonviolence uh, as Jean Sharp's people have, or the people uh, who used to be around Peter Ackerman, um, other people in universities and so on give courses on nonviolence. Is there a point of, of having, for example, a series of uh, of, of shows in, uh, in this forum series that might be of interest to teaching people how how to get how to try to get some social changes uh, when you're in a bad situation and you don't want to make it worse. I don't know whom to ask, but I think Constantine I, first, and, and then I, I, I will answer, uh, Meta. First of all, this is very new to me. Yeah, I know close to nothing about uh, the methods what you said um you know never we've never started political science never started uh, mm -hmm. you know opposing or anything like that so I'm basically let me tell you political scientists don't know either <laughs> most political scientists are not aware of this but mm -hmm. go on <laughs> i guarantee that people that i've spoken with here they have no clue okay <laughs> And you're absolutely right. I think it's really easy to picture, to paint the picture of what uh, Russia should look like. I know I have it painted in my head. Uh, mm -hmm. Many people imagine, and it's not that difficult. I made streams about it. You know, you need to have certain free institutions in the country. And, um, you know, that's, you need to have people understanding basic ideas, and that's pretty much a good start but how to get there <laughs> they have no clue i have no clue okay and i think it'd be good to uh at least to get an introduction to mm -hmm. some knowledge mm -hmm. okay andre uh i'm right now in the process actually of editing the russian uh translation of michael beer's book on you know where he analyzes uh, nonviolent methods and so forth but uh, in hey, who's, the hold on, whose book about what? Michael Beer, Nonviolent oh, International okay. Director. Mm -hmm. He tried to kind of for, re, do a review of the uh, you know 198 methods of Gene Sharp and see what what new stuff has came up and so forth in the years since you know Gene originally you know came up with all these ideas. Uh, however. However, on a practical point of view, I, you should understand that, uh, like uh, Konstantin said, and that's true in many, unfortunately, in many of the places where uh, Russian, uh, ex significant Russian expat communities exist today, as soon as you start doing professional trainings on nonviolent action and things like that, that might jeopardize the safety of these people. Uh, plus, it also should be understood that these people are exiled in exile. They they don't really have the opportunity to practice nonviolent action, you know, uh, against the Russian government. Except some maybe some some uh, possible demonstrations in front of Russian embassies and things like that. That don't really. I mean, it's it's a good thing, but they don't really have effect. And in many countries, they can put people in jeopardy just for doing that. You know. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, like one of the countries that I visited, there were cases where Russians found themselves in deep trouble just after bringing a, a yellow and blue bouquet of flowers to a, a statue of a Ukrainian, some Ukrainian uh, famous person, you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, because, because, again, we're not speaking about uh, Europe. We're speaking about Central Asian countries that have their own authoritarian regimes and that are also very very much linked to russia economically and in many other ways so so uh you know we have to be very realistic on what we can expect from people in these areas um the other thing is that uh you know in theory it's good but in practice if 
what we can do today if we can at least encourage people to speak more, you know, to convey uh, their view of events, uh, of political developments to their uh, circle of contacts in Russia in a way that won't be seen as offensive for their contacts. So their contacts would at least, they might disagree, but they will at least hear that. That's already a big step. It's way, way uh, far from, you know, any position where we can, you know, do actually nonviolent trainings in Russia today. Honestly speaking, with all respect, I don't see that as a, you know, something that is immediate perspective. It's interesting for people to study. There should be materials available about what kind of nonviolent uh, methods are uh, possible and things like that. And that's an important thing to have that in Russian language available. Yeah. But yeah. in terms of doing practical uh, trainings and things like that, right now, I'm not sure it's, it's going to be a very effective strategy. Okay. Jill? Yeah, I just want to echo what you're saying, Andre. I think it makes a lot of sense that the one of the so our techniques in India are very different from the gene sharp techniques. You know, they come from a different origin. It deals with different problems. Uh, so what we could offer, we would offer what we could offer is to talk about how we have handled in India certain nonviolent uh, practices um, and giving agency to certain, you know, marginalized communities. And these are the techniques. So if there was an interest, people could then see that and think of what the application is. And then you see how that could be built on. So that would be a realistic first step in my view um, is just to share techniques and experiences, um, implicitly saying, you know, getting people to think how that's relevant in our situation, right? Uh, so that, that I think would be a very good step. So I would reinforce what you said. First of all, I agree with Andre. The only country I know that allows for free political protest against the Russian government is Georgia. And uh, in other every other country of um, the former USSR, in the Central Asia, you get into big, big trouble for showing any kind of support to Ukraine or against Russia or whatever. They just don't like political showing of political views here. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andre, what 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 I would add to that is, it wouldn't hurt to have them and get acquainted and get the knowledge, if you know what I mean. It's like seeds; you see. Uh, you, it, it probably is impossible to train people in the sense of actually suggesting here's how you do things in, in Russia in particular uh, recommendations that might in, involve how to oppose the government. Any uh, specific things are uh, maybe impossible, but there are um, there are general principles. There are general. Uh, findings that have been established that uh, are worth knowing, uh, even if you never think you're going to uh, uh, use them. I taught a course at the University of Toronto on nonviolence and negotiation. And I we, we talked about a, a number of the methods. I had them read Gandhi's uh, experiments with truth. And um, what's the title, Jill? <laughs> That's quite right. But... Uh, no, uh, but um, but also uh, there. I don't think we have to make a choice between uh, Gene Sharp's approach and Gandhi's approach yeah, because yeah, all yeah. of these have insights that sure. can be can be learned. And yes. uh, I had I was teaching university students who probably never in their lives will have a need to stand up against a dictator. But it's not a bad thing to learn. And the, uh, my experience also has been, and, you know, I haven't been going to Russia lately, but for a long time, I went to Russia at least once a year for many years. And um, I, I, I really am a little puzzled why it's true. But every other country I went to, I could have a conversation about nonviolent resistance. 
and and sound credible and be accepted as as somebody making some kind of sense. But Russians had no interest, and I could not understand it. Even people, I was close to people in Gorbachev's government who had, and I was close to dissidents, people who practiced nonviolence, but who had no theoretical you know, interest in in the general ideas. Uh, they were they were doing things. They were going being sent to to uh, prison and and uh, all kinds of other things, exiled to Siberia and doing things that were real nonviolent resistance, but without any any um, try uh, attempt to understand it as a general principle, which always puzzled me because you know Russia uh, uh, told story. I mean, you should as out of just plain uh, curiosity about your own culture. People in Russia should be very interested in nonviolence because there is there are certain tensions and and traditions there the the traditions of the the Dukabors, for example a, a number of places where there's a, there should be an interest but I find I found then that there was uh, very little interest in understanding nonviolent methods and I, I would think it'd be possible to give a course in English for sure, but maybe even in Russian. I don't know who could do it in Russian, but there certainly must be people uh, in uh, many countries who are who have some expertise in nonviolent methods. Uh, I'm thinking of, for example, Erica Chenoweth and uh, Maria Stefan with their wonderful book. Um, people who could give Courses on, uh, you know, lectures and forums uh, discussions of, of nonviolent methods that would be something to put in in people's bank account in, in case the time ever comes when they need to, to, to practice it or when they could use it. Um, so just, you know, without jeopardizing things. Now, I would imagine the people in Russia could watch YouTube without in any trouble. If we put on shows on YouTube, would would anybody get in trouble just by watching? No. All right. YouTube is free. It's legal. You can watch anything. Well, this uh, is going to be our show today. It's going to be on YouTube. Now, if I if we made some more shows with people giving talks in Russian about which I don't know whether I can do, but I could surely get it done in English. Would there be any interest? There would be interest. There would be interest. Um, Meta and Andre, I agree with you that Russians have a history of political inactivity. And I, I know, I, I was born and raised in Russia, and the general idea among people is, what can we do? There's nothing we can do. So we're not going to even try, okay? Because uh, they think, they believe in in that their country does not belong to them it's not their country okay it's someone else's it's the higher ups it's the ones who are on top they know what to do they know how to run it and so forth i think it's a very historical phenomenon that that is in russia but please understand that um in the last 15 18 months lots of things has have changed and a lot of people uh in my rough estimation, around between two and three million people left Russia. In the situation, just as I did, by I, I didn't want to leave. I like Russia very much. You know, I wanted to keep on living in Moscow. I like Moscow, but I was forced. I feel I'm betrayed by my government and by my people who support the war. So I was forced to leave. And it's a personal tragedy for me and for you know, 2 million other Russians. And we have changed. We're not those politically inactive, um, you know, Russians that, that used to be, okay? At least some of us have changed because, you know, difficulties, the hardship changes people. And um, a lot of people are changed here. And that, that I, I know what I'm talking about. I'm seeing it around me, you know, like I said, 10-15%, definitely, perhaps even more. So uh, um, lectures like that, or not even lectures, knowledge in different forms, you know, would be very helpful. Okay. Andre. 
Well, I agree that knowledge would be very helpful, and I agree with what Constantine said. I do think that we have to be very uh, aware of the risks of organizing any any you know organized like seminars or things like that in, with with people in places like Uzbekistan. That's no, yeah, that's I wouldn't something. dare doing that because yeah. you know that, that that puts a great risk. Yeah. So so we just need to keep keep these things in mind, and so my approach is to go uh, forward. You know, find the 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 uh, ways in which we can address things that are, you know, we can't really be below the radar because you know we live in an area where basically everything we say may be everything you know on my computer that. My computer has access to might someone else might have access to I might not even know about that. That's reality. You know, at least you have to understand that that's a possibility. But um uh we we are trying to basically, you know, the, the what I'm trying to do is to work with people to help them to uh be able to discuss differences um without making enemies. Uh, uh, with you know people who stayed in the country, and uh, do it in a way without really pressing a certain political agenda, without pressing something. But but you know people like Constantine and the people that he's speaking about, they they got their lesson. They got their political lesson. Their life was turned upside down. My life was also turned upside down because I had to. I left you know nine years ago. Uh, these people left, you know, two years ago or a year ago. But uh, uh, they, I think that what we should do is we should basically work, when we work with them, we should just uh, say, you know, if you're interested, here are some ways. Yeah, you can look at YouTube video. You can communicate with people there. You can do this, you can do that. But we shouldn't be calling out for them, you know, at least, doing that in a very careful way. When I speak to people in different countries where I visit, I mean, I say that for me, you know, many people start saying, the, the typical thing that I hear everywhere where I meet is that, oh, this is, speaking to people in Russia is, is useless, they're brainwashed. It's not, it's not me saying that, it's not propaganda saying that, it's uh, people who left the country fairly recently saying that. And they say, we try. We, what I'm saying is, problem is you, your criteria of success are somewhat uh, uh, wrong because you think that you only are successful if you were able to convince someone of something. That's not the goal. The goal is that you can, uh, that you number one maintain relationship with that person. You still communicate with it. And number two, you can communicate with him about these tough subjects where you do disagree without uh, severing relationships and without becoming enemies. You know, uh, my idea right now is at this point, a realistic strategy is not to, you know, train people in Russia how they should do or things like that, but to simply uh, expose them <laughs> to alternative information. Uh and and uh, if we can be successful in that, we're already achieving a big deal. Because so many people, they simply do not get any alternative. I, I organize. Great, great, great mm -hmm. idea. I, you know, hands down. I think you're you're spot on. I could organize a series of forums like this with speakers who are who could talk about. Whereas well, Jill would be one of them. But I would all, if you, excuse me, Jill, but I would also include some people from sure, the sure, background. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think uh, that there are many different people who contributed uh, really wonderful insights and, and, and they, and we should look at how they did what they did, how they succeeded and or failed, but tried, you know, sometimes it didn't succeed, but there's, there's something to be learned from their experiences if we do it in a systematic way. So I think I could put this on easily uh, as a series of talks by um, people who've, who've made that their 
academic work um, in English. Now, I don't know whether I can't, I can't even visualize where I would get people who could do it in Russian because the people who are real have it, have some real expertise in this are not, they're not Russians, unfortunately. Tell me, would, you know, I don't know how, how many of the ex, escapee Russians are, um, speak English or would even be interested. Uh, would that have any, any appeal, Constantine? Peter. Uh, quite a few escapees. Uh, I call I call uh, uh, not the escapees. I call uh, the relicants, but it doesn't matter. Uh, quite a few speak English, and everyone is learning because they understand that in this new life, you have to know English. You have to learn how mm -hmm. you have to know how to speak it. But um, I had this idea. Uh, I think you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you can organize a series of lectures. How others did that? Not not like political lectures, but historical lectures. For example, Indians, the Gandhi approach, how they did that. Okay. So, and if a person watches, a person simply watches like a historical lecture. Okay, that would be fantastic. And don't worry about translating into Russian, because YouTube does that for you automatically. Okay, translate it now in all the languages, and you can put Russian subtitles, and that's it. Voila. Wonderful. Okay. The quality is very, very questionable. <laughs> I don't know. I, I never had a problem with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't really think of it in terms of lectures. I, I personally, I don't think that videos of lectures are... are I, I don't like to watch them, and I don't think that they're very informative. I think conversations are better, but I can I can organize this kind of thing pretty w well because I think this has been a good conversation, useful, and um, I I can organize say six or eight lectures by people who've taught peace uh, studies courses on uh, on nonviolence. Um, and the methods of it, um, uh, if and it would be in English. So uh, I, I don't know how much interest there is, but I I would love to do that. With in the back of my mind, it would be primarily for Russians. But if it's spoken in English, it's for everybody, isn't it? Any well, thoughts? I think lots of people would understand. That's. That's plain and simple. I don't know about Andre though. I think Andre is not sure. No, I, I think no. I I think that's a good idea. I'm not sure how many people would, uh, you know, from the Russian how many Russians are from the Russian expat community would uh, would uh, join. But it's 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 good to have that, you know. You know, Andre, be, I'll have uh, I'll make sure many people from Tashkent will watch it. <laughs> Maybe. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Well, okay. Um, I, my original idea was to have more of a dialogue among uh, escapee Russians. I love the term. I hadn't thought of it till you used it, Constantine. But I, I, I thought it would be good to have just more general discussions of among Russians uh, about their political ideas. But I think that I'm, I think maybe this might work where that might not work. And uh, I, I want to give, get one more sounding uh, as to your opinion about that before we close, although we're, <laughs> we've gone way over time, but I think it's important. A any, any further um, thoughts about it? Okay. And is is there anything that you were hoping you'd have a chance to say in this show that you didn't get a chance to say? Because I'll give you each more time to finish off your thoughts if you want. No? Well, I'd like to say a little bit about the Breakfast Club community. It's not the Breakfast Club is just a name. It's really the SKP's mm -hmm. community. It's real. It's large. It's powerful. Uh, 
and the power is has been unchanneled so basically it's uh you know it's we're not going in one direction we just you know i have organized a lot of people but that's as far as it has been so far you know we have uh private discussions personal discussions all the time we share ideas opinions but uh, we have not done anything publicly officially and so forth uh lots of good people here most people who have escaped russia are white collar professionals with high education uh lots of doctors lots of engineers it people every third is somehow involved with it information technology uh lots of um college professors teachers psychologists um good community we have lots of experts uh basically what we do every sunday is we pick one person uh and uh, he or she comes with something interesting to to share and we call it a lecture and they vary from like this from from uh how to uh save yourself from snake bites in the mountains of uzbekistan and wow. uh, <laughs> from spiders bites you know just plenty of venomous creatures here to uh, um you know history of uzbekistan or to our stories of escape uh or you know we talked extensively about um our stories you know how we feel what we have gone through and you know and then we organize lots of um meetings with discussion what to do next there's an expert comes and says how to um get a visa to the united states to canada to to european union you know what needs to be done what steps and so forth so mm-hmm. it's a support community and then uh first and then it's a uh, uh it's not political organization but it's angry the the angerness community if you know what i mean political angerness that is present uh in each one of them the reason i tried to extend the breakfast club idea is i feel there's a lot of possibilities of uniting russians and this is the first time it's being done in the world uh because russian diasporas they really non-existent andrew i think you would agree with me um there's one big one in new york city but it's not it's not organized if you know what i mean it's not it's um it's not what i would call the diaspora but this is the first time in history that we have we are united by a common goal or by a common problem by a common tragedy so to speak and that can be used as as glue to to glue everyone together so i feel like there's um there's um a great potential in uh, many countries and you were discussing earlier which countries people moved to like i think meta you asked if india is a good place i have not heard of many people going to india from uzbekistan or russians uh going to uzbekistan but they go to mostly southeast asia sri lanka thailand especially if they work remotely or they need this internet access you know designers uh teachers who teach online it programmers testers then um uh, sri lanka thailand uh bali then they go to um central asia uzbekistan georgia kazakhstan that's top three destinations and a lot of people try to make it to the usa canada and europe it's in- extremely difficult uh the most riskiest way is to go to mexico and try to cross the u.s border and then apply for political asylum lots of people do that but uh, with various degrees of success you know and uh, lots of people go to even mexico and um you know dominican republic uh even argentina believe it or not but i, I know that people have gone to argentina how do i know that because at breakfasts and andrew uh, he visited our breakfasts you know remember it's a hub really you know i see it, some people who come regularly sit and someone shows up and says hey i have a question um i need to i'm thinking of going to argentina can you help me and someone's like oh i know a guy who um helps with visas and another person goes oh i know who went to argentina already and then we connect people and this is how it works okay um 
I saw that in synagogue once. I attended synagogue. I'm not Jewish myself, but you know, I was invited quite a few times. And this is how they their Jewish community is. You know, a synagogue is more than a temple. It's it's a place where people help each other, and that's what I been trying to model the breakfast club after a synagogue and uh so um i feel i feel there's a um, great potential this anger um and there's opportunity to create for the first time in history to create this this uh real global community okay mm -hmm. um we've been looking at the official opposition there are lots of folks such as uh Hadarkovsky, you know Katz, milov they are in Europe, in the United States. They try to organize, but they fight with each other. You mm -hmm. know, they pull the blanket to themselves, and there's nothing, absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. So, uh, mm -hmm. and it's not masses. It's just some figures, political figures, who, you know, who try to act independently. What what I'm looking at is there's like millions of Russians all over the world now, and they can be organized. But again, I feel like I'm running against the wind, and it's really difficult. I, I'm i not a professional, you know, I came from business. I was an executive, mm -hmm. had my own business a couple times in life, and uh, this is a completely different new new area to me. So, well, you know, all, I, all I want is to be able to contribute a little bit. And I don't, I'm looking for ways in which I could help. And I have no idea, but that I, that's what I've been exploring. And I think this conversation is, from my point of view, it's been oriented toward trying to find a way in which maybe I could help a little bit. Meta, so, you yeah. have already helped a great deal, trust me. Because, you know, what happens when I go in the morning and we usually have like uh, news updates every morning. You know, so what's up? What happened? And I tell them, you know, there's a person in Toronto, Canada. And her name is Meta Spencer, and she cares. Mm -hmm. And I tell about our conversations, I tell about you, and that makes our lives, you know, uh, more cheerful. That helps a lot. Oh, my Believe goodness, what a sweet no thing to that, say. <laughs> I appreciate no, no that. that yeah. Well, it's true. Knowing yeah. that we are not alone, that people mm -hmm. in the West care, does wonders. Because at this point, we're sitting in Uzbekistan, and we feel like we're stuck. We're on our own. Mm -hmm. because no one wants us we're like stray dogs mm -hmm. okay uzbeks can well we don't need visas all right but they can also say hey you know what for some reason we don't want you to uzbekistan in uzbekistan where where would i go okay. where would i take my family my son goes to school here in uzbekistan okay so what to do next and i feel i'm absolutely rightless okay and um if i want to go to the west Say, no, 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 no. We take only rich, corrupt Russians who come to spend money that they stole from the Russian taxpayers. Oh, we, we take those. Are you those? No, you're not politicians. <laughs> oh, you don't support the war. We only take the ones who support the war. That seems like yeah. what's going on in Europe, in Canada, in the United States, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. Oh, if oh, you, don't, you, you don't support the war, eh, stay where you are, you know. Well, they don't want to I mean, the, the proof of that is that I've been trying for six months to organize a follow-up conversation about how to help Russians who are stranded in a country they don't particularly want to stay in, how to get them to a place where they would like to be. And I can't get any experts to talk about it. And that's, that's and these are good Canadian diplomats and and former, you know, this and that. I can't get people to talk about it. So I, I'm working on it, but I haven't forgotten, but I haven't succeeded either. So anyway. I know, uh, Mika, and I really, really appreciate it. And that's one of the reasons I tell, hey, look, there's a person who cares, who cares about us. And it makes world of a difference, okay? Well, bless um, your and, heart. And, Thank God. And, and <laughs> you are absolutely right. And we can't even get to the embassies. Mm -hmm. They say, well, you're in Uzbekistan, but you're a Russian citizen? Well, why don't you go back to Russia and go mm -hmm. to our embassy there? Because, you know, that's how it works. I said, are you crazy? We're not going to go back to Russia. But anyway. Yeah. So, uh, well, we keep working on it, Constantine. I promise you, for sure. Um, thank you. Thank hope. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And Jill, you've agreed already, I think, that if we try to put something together along the lines that I've suggested, maybe dialogues or uh, conversations among people who have some expertise in in uh, nonviolent resistance methodology, 
that sure. we can put these on and you'll be party to it, right? Absolutely. If I show up in the U.S. in a couple of months or so, yeah. any ideas of where I could present, you know, uh, universities or other places, you know? Uh, what, what's it called? Uh, it starts with a Omar or something like that. I've watched two excellent presentations about Russian expatriates. Uh, one was uh, a guy who was who had been a professor of political science at St. Petersburg and who is an escapee himself. But uh, I wanted to interview him on, on this series, but uh, he he's too busy trying to find a job, you know, because he, he's, you know, in the same situation as all the other guys can't find his way through. <laughs> Excuse me. There is a, a woman uh, who gave the talk there. So I could try to set, you know, contact those people and see if they'd like to invite you to give a talk. But there are lots of other people, uh, peace studies people, who might be able to set things up. And of course, in Canada, we could set, I, I'd be easy, it'd be easy to set up um, opportunities for you to give talks. Uh, in the U.S. is a little more complicated, but I'll work on it, okay? Does yeah, that help? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Okay, thank, thank you all, you. and Bye. have a great day, whatever's left of it thank for you. you. Okay. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you. I should say the world produces these forums. And this is episode 576. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website to save the world.ca. You can share information there about global issues as well. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers, or just look at the spell bar. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You could subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser. And in the search bar, enter the word Peace. You'll see buttons to click to subscribe.